episode number 90. Welcome to All About Breastfeeding, the place where the girls hang out. I am your host, Lori Jo Eisenstadt, IBCLC. From time to time, I found that it works out nicely to replace some of our most popular shows. We have many new listeners each month, and some don't know they can go back to the beginning and listen to all the previous shows. Today, I will replay part one, and on Thursday, I will replay part two of my interview with Maureen Minchin. She is the author of Milk Matters, Infant Feeding and Immune Disorder. When I interviewed her the first time, I had just received her book and had not yet quite made a dent in it. Once you see it, you'll know why. It is an impressive trilogy with book one, book two, and book three, which is chock full of information and over 800 pages. Now that I've had the opportunity to really get into it, I'm even more impressed than I initially was. This book is a mass of incredible information on infant feeding. Enjoy the show. The one thing you can't do is let yourself get into the guilt trip about, oh, if only I'd known I should have done this, I should have done that. It wasn't my fault. Balloons, bazookas, boob, boobies, bosoms, boulders, cans, hooters, knockers, melons, honkers, jugs, rack, tatas, tits, torpedoes, guns, bust, doorknobs, coconuts, and our favorite one, the girls. Welcome to the All About Breastfeeding Show, where your host, Lori, highlights mothers just like yourself and goes beyond the surface questions and digs deep so they share not only their joys and happiness in their daily breastfeeding life, but also their pain and struggles and how they worked through them. Welcome to All About Breastfeeding, the place where the girls hang out. Episode number 45. My guest today is a real firecracker. She has tons of energy and is a self-proclaimed night owl. She scheduled our interview for midnight, her time, which was much earlier my time. And she was not kidding. She went on for several hours as we chatted off the record before the show and after the show. It was about 3 a.m. her time when we say goodbye, and she was still bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And I have no doubt that she could have gone on easily for another few more hours. I learned so much from her today about breastfeeding and human milk and allergies, as well as formulas and recommendations about starting babies on table foods. She has written an incredible new book, which I encourage anyone who works with women in their childbearing years and babies should definitely read. This show is brought to you in two parts. I am happy to give a warm introduction, and then we will get on with the show. Today, I would love to introduce my guest. She is a medical historian and health educator. She's been involved in global efforts to promote evidence-based infant feeding for decades and is internationally recognized for her pivotal role in creating the lactation consultant profession. She has been a consultant to international bodies, such as the World Health Organization, and the United Nations Children's Fund. She has educated health professionals, including through creating university-based courses in the UK and Australia. And she is an editorial board member for the Open Access Online International Breastfeeding Journal. She is also the author of Food for Thought, A Parent's Guide to Food Intolerance and Breastfeeding Matters, What We Need to Know About Infant Feeding as well as journal articles and background briefing papers for the WHO, World Health Organization, and USAID. Having three children in the 1970s, she experienced hospital-based practices that made breastfeeding difficult and allergy inevitable, with life-changing consequences for her children. She has since spent a lifetime providing advice and support to allergic families while also working to improve health professionals, education, and training. I would love to welcome Maureen Minchin to the All About Breastfeeding Show. Welcome, Maureen. Thank you, Laurie. I'm glad to be here. 
What intro. You've done so very much, and we're really going to get into a lot of it today. I would love for you to first tell us a little bit about the background of your life, like where you grew up, how you grew up, and kind of segue into how it is you came to do the work that you're doing. I came to do the work that I was doing because I had a child. I was doing very different things and then had the baby. And I didn't realize, as so many mothers didn't realize, just how difficult breastfeeding could be in the 1970s when absolutely nobody gave good advice about how to attach a baby to the breast so that, in point of fact, you weren't suffering. I suffered excruciating pain for three months, and the only reason I persevered with breastfeeding was because my mother, who had been poor in the 1940s when I was born, had similar problems, but because she was poor, she persevered. And she kept saying to me the opposite of what my friends' mothers were saying to them. She kept saying to me, yes, it's appalling. Yes, it's dreadful. The the pain is worse than childbirth. Oh, it's so terrible. But when you get past all this, there is nothing like it, and you just have to persevere. And I had middle class friends whose mothers had been middle class in the 1940s and who had taken medical advice about what to do. And their mothers were saying to them, oh, darling, why are you persisting with this? Look, it's killing you. Why would you do this? There's no need. The formulas we have nowadays are so good. Look, I brought you up on formula and you're fine. And, of course, they stopped breastfeeding. So I credit my mother with the fact that I breastfed. Yes, I had to put up with the pain, but she was absolutely right. What I realized from the experience of actually persevering was that there is indeed absolutely no experience in life like it, that it is an absolutely fundamental female human experience and that it actually teaches you how to be a mother because you can only succeed with breastfeeding if you breastfeed responsively. And you learn pretty quickly with a child that the only way to have a happy life with a child is to be responsive, which doesn't mean to do everything on their terms, but it means to respond to them quickly and promptly and try and see things from their point of view and work out ways to go on together, which is what I had to do with the breastfeeding problems that I had. Because the second part of what made life a nightmare as a first-time mother was the fact that my son had been given cow's milk formula comps in hospital, little bottles of it, before he ever went home. And I took home a happy, apparently happy baby and managed to get breastfeeding going despite primary and secondary hemorrhages. And two weeks after I got home, he started to scream and he didn't stop screaming or having difficulties with sleep until he was four and a half years old. And the day that I took cow's milk out of his diet was the day that both I and his father got up and went into the bedroom to see if he had died in his sleep because it was the first time in four and a half years that we hadn't heard him moaning and thrashing around in the bed. (laughs) Oh, boy, what a story. (laughs) So that kind of sidetracked me. When I realized the the problems with nipples ended the day after I read a book by a UK doctor whom no one was listening to, who talked about positioning and attachment, I corrected the way that I was holding the baby and the next thing you know, I was pain-free within 48 hours. And I was so angry. I can't tell you how angry I was. <laughs> I wanted to kill every health professional <laughs> for not having for not having been given that information, right? Yes, that's right, exactly. And I thought women have to know about this sort of thing. And because I had done a recent history of a, a professional group, I knew where the medical libraries were. I started reading, and I haven't stopped. So when and my son was around 16. He continued to have problems because having been made allergic by that cow's milk, even though he avoided it in his diet after he was four and a half, that's years, not months or days. In fact, he went on having medical problems. And after one particularly traumatic problem, he said to me, Mum, I wish you'd known what you needed to be a competent mother before you had me instead of looking <laughs> on me. <laughs> To which I replied, 
while my heart was breaking at one level, at another level, I knew he didn't mean it and he did. You know, it's he was perfectly right. justified in saying it. And I replied to him, well, darling, just think about this. If you were to die tomorrow, your life would already have been really worthwhile because think of the people who have been helped because you have had such a horrible experience. <laughs> what a way to turn it around, Maureen. <laughs> Well, you have to because the one thing you can't do is let yourself get into the guilt trip about, oh, if only I'd known I should have done this, I should have done that. It wasn't my fault. I do feel regret that he had such a bad start. At almost 40 years of age, he still has chronic inflammatory diseases as a consequence of long-term problems with allergy. And it tends to be that people grow out of the early problems only to grow into later autoimmune disease by middle age. I do regret it bitterly, and I'd rather that hadn't been the way it happened. But on the other hand, I wasn't the one who was supposed to know what to do. <laughs> You're relying on the experts, right? That's right. I was. And unfortunately... At that time, there were no experts. There are still far too few. And unfortunately, many mothers uh, that I talk to today, 40 years later, are having exactly the same problems as I had, which just makes me so angry again that I'll never be able to give this up. You know, I'll, I'll have to continue till I drop dead because I think it's just so fundamental, such an important thing for women to be able to breastfeed their babies. And they all want to. There's a tiny minority who don't want to. I'm not bothered by them. You know, that's their choice. They're welcome to make bad choices in their lives. We're all welcome to make bad choices in our lives. But the fact of the matter is most women who are formula feeding did not make that choice. They were forced into it by a lack of help at the critical time when help was there. As I say, what my mother said to me, that she acknowledged my pain and distress, she acknowledged how important it was, but then she said, it does get better, persevere. And that's the difference. Now, do you also, do you also think about your mother and the lack of help that she probably had? Because, so she was in pain for a long time also. And so she accepted that that would be the norm for you when we know that if there's if you get the proper help, proper latch, that that should not have been even for your mother, right? Yes, it shouldn't have been for her. But, in fact, she worked through it, and it didn't go on as long for her. I think she was just a naturally good breastfeeder because she was taking no notice of anything except what the baby seemed to want. And she gave descriptions of how, you know, how we all were as babies, which was all very different. So she followed what her baby wanted her to say, but that didn't mean that she didn't get mastitis. And in those days, she went to a doctor with an abscess and sat there in his surgery while he plunged a scalpel into her breast and expressed oh. it <laughs> with no oh. anesthesia whatsoever. <laughs> Ah, we're both holding our breasts now, right? <laughs> so you see, my mother could talk about pain and difficulty in breastfeeding and still say it was worth doing. And that's what I say to women. You know, yes, it may be difficult to get started. It shouldn't be. It may be, um, but it shouldn't be. However, no physical activity we do is without problems for some people. I mean, we don't expect all kidneys to work perfectly or all any heart to work perfectly. There's no reason why every breast should work perfectly, except that, in fact, you can be pretty sure it will because this is the most fundamental survival mechanism there is for mothers and babies. And nature's pretty economical. We generally don't get to the stage of producing a healthy baby and then not being able to feed it. Usually what happens if you aren't going to be able to feed the baby, you don't get that baby to term. So I believe that it's a fundamental survival mechanism that is robust, resilient and reliable. And if only we get the right help, every woman would be able to breastfeed, short of those who've already had bilateral mastectomies. <laughs> so I would like to know a couple of things. One is the hospital practice that you did not receive. What happened in the hospital that you feel the help that you did not receive? And the other question is, for I know formula has evolved and there are variations of the same thing. But I also know that in the 30s and 40s, formula was still far different than what it is now. So I'm curious to know what formula was when you had children 
And again, when you're talking about, and for your mother, when you talked about growing up poor and it was economical. So to me, that sounds like there was little money to pay for the formula. So I'm curious to know if you know what the ingredients were at that time, what the ingredients were when you had your baby compared to what we, what we know now. Okay. That's an easy one to answer. But first I'll say, what help would I have wanted in the hospital? If any woman wants to succeed, I think there are two things that are absolutely critical. One is that you keep your baby with you and have that baby skin to skin with you as much as possible while you're in hospital. And if not with you, with somebody else skin to skin, the father of the baby or your mum or whoever, because that minimizes the demands the baby is going to make on the mother because the baby is being assisted as it should be by the body of another person to regulate its temperature. It doesn't need as many nutrients and so and it's also protected from well meaning people who think that it might need other nutrients and want to put them into it. And the second part is make sure that breastfeeding is exclusive if at all possible. Sometimes it may not be possible. Then you ask for donor breast milk if you haven't been able to express some colostrum yourself, if there are reasons why you, you just don't have enough in the first little while. The two things that did me in were the fact that the hospital staff didn't recognize poor positioning, although I even asked about it. I said, my nipple looks squashed when it comes out of the baby's mouth. And they said, oh, don't worry about it, dear. That's normal. Lots of women's nipples look like that. Now, it seemed to me that that was silly, that it should look squashed, because then it started to crack, and that was where we got on from cracking to developing thrush in the fissure that had developed and, and so on and so forth. That was the three months of agony as a consequence of that particular piece. And the other was the problem for Philip that was caused by the giving of formula and it was very difficult. Infant formula was introduced. It was the best sales tactic the companies ever came up with was to provide formula free to the hospitals that were major maternity centres and the hospitals then passed it on to mothers and used it quite needlessly in many, many places on a, a, a national scale. And because they did it across the whole culture in that time frame, the symptoms that it caused, which emerged about 10 to 21 days after you go home, if, if you weren't allergic yourself and that formula sensitizes your baby and makes it allergic, it'll be 10 to 21 days before that baby starts to cry and have a miserable gut and behave badly and make you feel that you're a hopeless mother. However, we're now in a situation where many of the fully breastfed babies do still cry because their mothers were formula fed like that in the last generation and they are sensitizing babies before they're ever born. There's really a lot of research now showing that babies who are going to be allergic have already had immune changes while they were being born, while they were being growing inside their mothers. So the two things that I think are really important are avoid any formula in hospital and try to keep your baby close. Do it safely and make sure that you've provided, you've taken in with you comfy wraps and slings that mean that the baby can be safe with you and you're not going to drop it. Though nobody's ever heard of people dropping babies in many cultures where this is normal. So those are the things that I think do those two things and you've got a fighting chance of having Children like the two grandchildren I've had in the last 12 months, both were born prematurely, both were caesarean sections, and uh, one was prem, one was term, and both were caesarean sections. Both got antibiotics because of the caesarean sections. Both turned out to be placid, beautiful, calm, just joys to have, babies that were absolutely the sort of baby that we all hope that we get, the baby that's sometimes called the good baby and which I tell mothers is the normal baby because that baby has not had its gut disturbed by getting other things put into it that were never intended for human infants. Now, second part of your question was about formula and how different are they? now from what they were in the 40s or the 70s. 
That's a large part of the, the book that you didn't mention that I've just recently written, Milk Matters, Infant Feeding and Immune Disorder, which summarises virtually all of the information that I've accumulated over 40 years of working with mothers. In fact, it's three books under one cover, and the first part of it is the science, the second part of it is the history of infant formula, and the third book in it is a practical one. If you've got one of these miserable babies, what do you do? And that begins with a questionnaire that enables you to assess how likely it is that you have are you going to have a miserable baby if you are not very careful. So that's an allergy questionnaire, obviously. So to get back to the formula question, I've got all the detail of that in the second part of Milk Matters. But to summarise it, basically... There's not that much difference. Although the companies will tell you that there are huge differences, the most significant differences between 1940 and now actually happened in the 1970s when they managed to reduce the sodium content of the formulas, but they still went on having, and they also changed some of the protein formulations in the formulas. But we still don't have, one thing I'd love to have would be a comparative trial, you couldn't do it anymore now, but of the babies that were fed the homemade formulas in the 1940s, which were we all agree now shouldn't be done because we know they lacked selenium and they lacked all sorts of things that you can only put in if, in fact, you are a major company. And I really do want people not to even dream about creating homemade formulas. It's not, it's much too complex a task for anyone to be able to achieve at home without either overfeeding or underfeeding their baby in any kind of way. So if you don't have breast milk access and you don't have breast milk, you must rely on current modern formulas. And I want that message to come across clearly. But what for Right, because there's all kinds of formulations over the internet, right, that people can make their own homemade formula. That's right. And none of them, I mean, they will, babies are great survivors. Babies survived on evaporated milk, which was diluted and to which lactose or other sugars were added. And then they got fresh squeezed orange juice and cod liver oil and all sorts of things added. Those are the people who are now saying to their, their own children and their grandchildren, oh, you don't have to worry. You were formula fed and you're fine. Now, in actual fact, most of them are fine within the range of normal, but you only have to look at the diseases that have become endemic in Western society to think that maybe not everybody is as fine as they think they are because those those diseases are not present to anything like the same degree in cultures where babies were not formula fed. But the right. So people people don't realize, you know, what they've grown accustomed to becoming normal is not really normal. That's right. Absolutely. In the 1970s and 1980s, we mothers were telling the doctors that attention deficit disorder was increasing, that we had hyperactive children. That And of course, these were all children who had been fed formula in hospital. And the doctors were telling us that we were just maladjusted mothers, that basically we didn't understand this was normal child behavior. We now have every classroom in our country has autistic children who were not there in pre Previous generations, and it wasn't because they were in institutions. We didn't have the epidemic of autism we now do. And of course, what I'm arguing in the book is that the epidemics of disease that we're seeing are compounding because each generation is being born out of the bodies of the previous one. And if you distort the immune system of the grandmother, then the mother will be affected. If you distort her immune system, the child will be affected. And in fact, we know that this affects of nutrition actually extends into at least three generations. There's actually a, an extraordinary epigenetics infographic by one of the infant formula companies which spells this out really clearly, that nutrition affects not only the person themselves but their ch children and their grandchildren. We can either come back to it. I wanted you to address that now because I know that mothers are thinking, some mothers who have exclusively breastfed their babies – and see some allergy-like symptoms in their babies, or you mentioned autism, et cetera. And, and we're thinking, but I exclusively breastfed my baby. Yes. So can you explain that to me? 
Yeah. You see, the thing is, what determines whether or not we have diseases is not just our genes, but how our genes are expressed. And various environmental influences influence how those genes get expressed. Nutrition is one of the biggest, and in fact, the scientists now seem to agree that it is the single largest postnatal influence on childhood development, that children, how you feed your child, as one um, specialist said, how we feed um, babies uh, uh, alters their biology for life because they now think that you program a baby by what you do. Now, why aren't the exclusively breastfed babies doing as well as they should or as we think they should? because of what happened to their mothers and their grandmothers. The way that they're born now, there's just been a very recent study showing that certain cells are in different forms, are expressed differently um, in babies at birth, and that this is a reliable predictor of whether or not those children will go on to have allergy. So the woman who exclusively breastfeeds is doing the best she can to repair the pregnancy damage. What mums don't realise is that In fact, breast milk contains lots of stem cells. You are the only person in the world who can give your baby free stem cell therapy. And probably there is a role for those stem cells in breast milk to go places within the body and to repair what can be repaired within that damage that's been done by the previous generation's mistakes about feeding. But, of course, we don't... And, of course, there's thousands of other components of breast milk that are important as well in helping to develop the child to the best that it can be. But the best that that child can be is to some extent influenced by what happened to the mother. And we've had this shift between... In the 1940s, it was poor women who breastfed and wealthy women, advantaged women who formula fed. By the 1960s and 70s, it was the wealthy women, the advantaged women, who were going back to breastfeeding, and it was poor women who were stuck with formula feeding. So we've had this swap over where it's very likely that many of the women now breastfeeding were themselves, they were certainly not exclusively breastfed and they were not breastfed for any length of time because it wasn't normal to breastfeed past, I was told that it would be incestuous to breastfeed a boy past the age of three months of age. (laughs) The magical three months. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) And, of course, the companies were advertising um, give them other foods by six, eight weeks, 12 weeks at most in the 1970s. So you can say all Western populations had terrible nutritional practices going into the women who were going to the, – the children who were going to grow up to be the women who would breastfeed the next generation. So we can't expect perfection. To find an exclusively breastfeeding mother who was herself exclusively breastfed is a very rare thing because of, as I say, so many social changes that happened. So I think breastfeeding mothers should take pride in the fact – that they're doing what they can to repair the damage that's been done through generations and certainly things would be likely to be much worse if they hadn't breastfed. But we don't know what they would have been like if the mother herself had been fully exclusively breastfed, just as we can't know how much worse it would be if instead of breastfeeding that child, she had formula fed the child. All you can do is your best in the here and now. And our best for some children, like my grandchildren, who both have two sets of allergic parents, both of those seem to have no allergies at the age of about 12 and 13 months. And they've been a delight to have, by contrast with the the problems that their, their parents had as babies. Taking a little break so I can share this info with you. I am really psyched to be able to share this next piece of news with you. My regular listeners are very familiar at this point with Momentum, the organization that I talk about on each show. You know the one that I say, Save My Life as a New Mother, the organization that helped me find other mothers who were new at this whole mothering thing. They became my people. They helped me navigate that first year of motherhood and continue to mother me as I had more kids and my need for support through their toddler years and kindergarten years and elementary school years just kept being needed. I made lifelong friends and they were so helpful that I am doing all I can to continue to support the organization. 
I want momentum to continue to thrive, and I want you, my All About Breastfeeding audience, to experience just some of what momentum is all about. The ladies of Momentum have agreed to give my listeners a 14-day trial membership so you can see what this mother-centered thing is all about at no cost to you. Just hop on over to allaboutbreastfeeding.biz forward slash podcast. You will see a link from Momentum. It's in blue. And you just click it on and it will bring you to the page for you to sign up for your free trial. Honestly and truly, there's absolutely no cost to you. This is just a great opportunity for you to enjoy the discussion groups and the blogs and webinars and educational pieces that are available for free for you. I will have a link to this in the show notes. And now, back to the show. What do you feel is the the single most important action that mothers can take in their health during their pregnancy? So they can help to make changes during their pregnancy to reduce allergies in their newborn and then, of course, breastfeed their baby. But is there anything that they can do during their pregnancy? Is this even possible? Yes, it is. And I've been advising mothers about this for years. The trouble is every person is an individual and there is no one magic bullet that we can provide or one magic sentence we can say or one magic thing you can do. The best thing you can do is to begin before you have babies because being healthy preconceptually is a good start. To be healthy during the pregnancy is also another major thing, not to eat too much junk food or, or the sorts of things. You know, have a good diet. But don't follow a dietary advice that says you must have A, B, C, D, E and F Actually pay attention to your own body during pregnancy. And if a food makes you sick, don't go on having it because someone else says that's a good food. It may be a good food for them. It may not be for you. It may be the very thing that's going to sensitize your baby in utero and cause problems. So the foods you pay attention to during pregnancy are foods that you either loathe you don't yourself eat them, no matter what anyone says about how important they are. Even if it's like, you know, we're, we're saying eat, you need to eat a lot of greens. Yes. You- so you're saying that that's really turning you off to just not eat greens? No, it's not. It's not Usually it's not greens that are making you sick. Okay. I'm talking in terms of there are good foods like dairy, for instance, which is often because cow's milk has been used in formula in the way it has for so long, you know, you know, probably four or five generations in America by now, cow's milk is often a problem for some people, but it's not something we want everybody to avoid because it's also a useful food. However, you don't ramp up your intake during pregnancy. You don't say, oh, I've got to drink at least a litre of milk, which is what we were told in the 1970s. You don't have milk, cheese, yogurt and everything else every day all the time if you yourself were not fully exclusively breastfed because milk of any animal is in fact a very powerful immunological agent and cow's milk is designed to create the appropriate immune system for a calf Now, some of that's deactivated by the heat treatments, but it is still a very powerful food that mothers, some mothers, um, I know plenty of mothers who've suffered from good old constant pregnancy vomiting, really severe vomiting. Um, Hyperemesis? Yeah, that's right. I didn't want to use the word. I was trying to (laughs) to avoid the technicalities. Do you know... Yeah, but you know what? It's interesting. So to the lay person, we can say just vomiting all the time, but to to the, the millions of pregnant mothers who have been through it and their friends and their family, they're all very well aware of that, that Yes, word. that's right. Well, you know, I always say think about what you're eating. Is there anything that you're eating that you don't really like but you're making yourself have because you know it's a good food? Or is there – or are you – is there some food that you really like and now that you're pregnant, you really crave it and you're making sure you have lots of it because being pregnant, you can afford to eat more. So avoidance or aver- aversion to a food 
or addiction to a food are often markers of something being your body's responding to them in an abnormal way. And sometimes that's the quick way to identify your allergens. But, you know, this is a very shorthand way of, of saying something that is much more complicated. And that's why I wrote the third part of the book, which starts with the questionnaire. So it helps you identify what your individual problems may be and then says, well, what do you do before pregnancy? What do you do during pregnancy? What do you do around the birth? What do you do after the birth? But if you can't, if you can't actually do that, at least don't make yourself eat foods that make yourself sick. Pay attention to what your body's saying. If things, when you smell them, just smell repugnant, it's quite likely that your body is saying, uh, uh, not a good thing for you. So you're saying that in pregnancy, we are educated and we know what it is we should be eating. And yet our body is telling us something else. Yes. So there are moms then who are trying to not only eat those foods, but even eat them in excess because, like you said, the leader of milk. So we are like other things in life. We're ignoring what our uh, gut is kind of telling us in a way in this Literally situation. Literally what our also, gut is right? telling us. You know, our gut is actually directing us about many of these things. If we're addicted to it, it's it's demanding it. And if we're averse to it, it's rejecting it. It's making us vomit. And if, in fact, it doesn't vomit at all back up, it'll give us diarrhea to speed it out the other end. And those are protective mechanisms. Both vomiting and diarrhea indicates that something is going into your body that your body, which knows better than your brain, something sometimes, is aware is not a great idea. Now, there's lots of things I could talk for ages about vomiting and diarrhea, but we won't. (laughs) I didn't even answer that question about how different are the formulas. If you want to go back to that. Yeah, and you mentioned before because you talked about the, the different ingredients in the formula and making your own. I know that here in the United States, in the my mother raised her kids in the 50s and for at least the first two or three kids she did make her own formula that was common and she was mixing carnation instant milk yeah. powder evaporated with, milk yep evaporated milk with uh, corn syrup it, it right. even bothers me to even say those words out loud yes. because this is what we were raised on but then of course by Literally the third or fourth week, we were already getting rice cereal and that kind of stuff. And that's so exactly right. Just, and what yeah. what people forget is that it's not really just the milk that goes into the child. It should only be breast milk, and breast milk is a complete menu, and there is no need for anything else under six months. But when you're talking about artificial feeding, formulas have always been used in conjunction with other things. So that for us with evaporated milks or with powdered milks, it was babies also got given vitamin drops, they got given fresh squeezed orange juice, they got given early cereals, early widening of the diet, all of that sort of thing. So the total diet is what determines how well people turn out. We've now got people completely reliant on a single industrial product, infant formula, and told them not to give all of the other things any earlier than three to four months. And in fact, what people don't realize is that the four months debate, there's a big debate about whether it should be four months or six months when you introduce other foods. In fact, if you look at the scientific evidence, and I've got a post online about this, if people go to my Facebook page and track down my posts, they'll find there's a big discussion of the complementary foods issue. When do you introduce it? In brief, it should be four months, no later. It could even be a bit earlier for artificially fed children who are on infant formulas as a precaution, and it shouldn't be until around six months for the breastfed because there's no need for it, and anything you introduce is less valuable than breast milk in that time. We really need a two-stage piece of advice about weaning foods, and the formula companies know this perfectly well, which is why they have stuck with saying around four months. Now, why did four months get chosen? If you go back to 1980, when the American Academy of Pediatrics came up with four months as the agreed 
date. They did it for both breast and formula-fed kids, and they were challenged on this in the pages of Pediatrics. A letter was published by a pediatrician saying, why are you saying four months when all of the signs you catalogue occur between five and seven months? Why aren't you saying six months for introducing other foods? And there was a letter from the chairman of the AAP committee that came up with that four-month recommendation. He said quite clearly that putting things together we have to try and protect the formula-fed baby from possible deficiencies, while the breastfed baby, the, he actually said something like, there is no advantage and some disadvantage to the breastfed child in introducing solids early. However, with the formula-fed child, no matter how good the formula, there is always a risk of, of problems. And therefore, putting these things together, we think four months is a reasonable time frame. Why four months? Because by four months, body stores of certain nutrients are likely to be exhausted. And if they happen not to be in the formula, then in fact, the kid could be in trouble if you go on feeding the formula exclusively. So widening the diet of the formula fed child at four months does actually make sense. Widening the diet of the breastfed child at four months does not. And that's the difference. Why don't we have two different recommendations? Well, why do you think? Because what would the message be if mothers were told, well, you know, breast milk is so good, you can easily use it around six months, sometimes even longer. Some babies will be fine on that. It's not really until about nine months that there starts to be issues of possible deficiencies for the breastfed child. But, you know, with a formula-fed child, you can never be really certain that the formula has everything they need. So it's safe to, it's safer to widen the diet from four months. We would be breaking that assumption that formula is really breast milk in a can if, in fact, we were to come up with two recommendations. And so the industry is very, very strongly concerned to try and make sure that message doesn't get out there. And many of the people who are arguing for four months still are actually doing so on the basis of very poor studies, but without ever saying that their real agenda is to protect the artificially fed child from deficiency or excessive nutrients. I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes about the guilt that some mothers feel if they didn't breastfeed, couldn't breastfeed, or maybe didn't even want to breastfeed. So that's that's a, a whole other big discussion, but I want to address it in just a minute. But what I'm hearing you say is that the formula-fed babies, there is a deficiency at a certain period of time, three or four months, that we're saying they need to start getting other foods in order to balance their diet. And this will happen with formula-fed babies. But at the same time, it's the, the time frame is different, but we're also saying that at a certain point for breastfed babies, at a certain point, there will be some deficiencies and the recommendation is to start adding other foods. So we're saying that all babies at a certain point need to bring in other foods into their daily diet, but it's different for formula fed and it's different for breastfed babies. Absolutely. And there may or may not be deficiencies. Uh, there are more likely to be excesses, in fact, with formula than deficiencies. Um, one of the big changes that's happened with formulas has been that the protein content has been dramatically reduced over time because the companies have recognized that excess protein being given in the early days of life is actually one of the major drivers of obesity in childhood, which, of course, translates to the obesity epidemics we have throughout the Western world. They are getting down. And when parents ask what formula would you use, I say choose the one with the lowest protein content. Many parents choose the one with the highest protein content, thinking protein equals good, more of a good thing, I'll choose that one. In fact, the very reverse is true. The lowest levels of protein that are currently on the market are still well in excess of what uh, is in breast milk. And it's a problem because they can't really get the much lower without changing exactly not just the amount but the quality of the protein. The quality of protein in formula is different from that in breast milk. Wasn't that the same with uh, for a while with iron too, that it was uh, in excessive amounts and we've reduced that also because the in excessive iron can Oh, yes, there's been excesses. Issues. There was excess fluoride in formula. They've now taken it out 
that was ha- g- getting in there because, in point of fact, they were making up the formulas with fluoridated water when they first created the formulas because many formulas go, start as a liquid milk, get turned into a, a milk powder, get rehydrated with water to have things added to them, get heat treated again. You know, we're talking about an industrial process here and the water that was being used was fluoridated and they found there were very high levels of fluoride in formula. They had to deal with that. They now only make formula with unfluoridated water because the local water supplies are going to be adding fluoride when, in fact, the mothers make up the powder yet again. Based on what we learn as we go, formulas are constantly ever-changing also. Constantly ever-changing and improving in some degrees, but creating new problems they do. This is the issue that people think we've got really pretty close to perfection If you read any of the industry literature about this, you'll realize there are ongoing problems. The more they heat treat, the more they create free radicals. There's a whole range of issues that they're working very hard to try and fix, but each generation of babies is the group that are actually having to endure the experiment while they're trying to fix it. For instance, the new adding the omega-3 fatty acids to formula was possible only because they were able to use a process that employed genetically modified marine algae and soil fungi to actually make up these fats in large quantities in on an industrial scale. Those then had to be purified and extracted um, from the bubbling mass of pots they were in. And in the process of extraction, they were using chemicals that in fact left traces in the formula. That's been changed again, but there's still issues. And that was causing, I remember when those formulas came out, all of a sudden in the newborn nurseries, we had uh, a fair amount of little babies who were having uh, excessive diarrhea. Yes, exactly, because the traces of hexane and the unnatural oils produced by soil fungi and marine algae, which got touted as we've got DHA, we've got ARA, you know, everyone thinks they're good things. Well, they are if you're eating them in salmon and in all the rest of it. We don't know whether they are or not um, when it comes down to extracting them industrially like this, adding them to other things in the formula and producing them in the way that they're fed to babies. Each new change to formulation is an acknowledgement of the problems that formula has, but it's never seen as that. We somehow seem to think that we're improving on perfection all the time, that it's always been good because, after all, we grew up on it and we're fine, and we don't pay attention to the fact that we have ongoing problems that might indeed be related to it. And at the same time, we don't see every new change as being, oh, God, they've discovered a new problem, haven't they? And they're now trying to fix it. What happened to the people who weren't getting the selenium beforehand, was that implicated in X, Y, Z? The part of the book that goes through the history of formula is in many ways completely devastating to parents who read it because they relate all this back to how they fed their kids, how they were fed, and all of a sudden a lot of things start to become of concern, which they should be of concern. You know, They should be of such concern that we, in fact, don't, continue to use cow's milk as the basis for our formulas, but we actually set up national schemes of milk banking so that women's milk can be made available to women who are not able to feed their own children. This is the end of part one, episode number 45 with Maureen Minchin. There is lots more to this interview, so go ahead and check out and download episode number 46.